Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just take a few seconds and talk to the Lord. What do you need God to say to you on today? Those of you that know that the holidays are a hard time for you, what do you need to hear from Jesus on today? Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you for each and every person that stands in this room. Thank you, Lord, that in spite of everything that's happened in the world and in our lives, we can stand in this room uh, because you've kept us. You've allowed us to see another year. Father, as we come upon the end of this year, thank you that you let us see December. So many people didn't see it. So many people didn't make it. So many started out in January that are with, not with us now. And so, God, we thank you uh, that your grace and your mercy has allowed us to make it thus far. And we acknowledge and we know that had it not been for you on our side, we don't know where we would be. And so, Father, we stand in this place saying thank you. We say thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for being the intercessor that sits at the right hand and, and makes up reasons and excuses for us, that covers us. Thank you for the blood that covers each and everything, each and every sin. Thank you that you love us in spite of ourselves. Thank you that you watch over us when others walk out. Thank you that you love us at midnight hours. Thank you that you're there in the dark times. Thank you that you loved us so much, God, that you didn't think it was robbery, but you came down and dwelt in sinful flesh. You came and lived among us. You suffered as we suffered. You cried as we cried. You were hungry as we get hungry. And thank you so much that in spite of all that, you still stood strong. You still were without sin, so much so that you were able to be the perfect sacrifice on the cross just for us. And so, God, this holiday season, we don't uh, lament gifts or what we can buy and what we can't buy. We exalt you, Jesus. We lift you up in this place. In spite of how we feel, in spite of what it looks like, we say thank you and blessed be your name. And so, God, we worship you in this place. We glorify you now. Thank you for waiting for us. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Find somebody you do not know. Love on them. Give them a hug. Tell them, hey. Tell them. Oh, yeah. Somebody you don't know. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Ruth, chapter 1. Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Ruth, chapter 1. When you get it, say, I got it. We thank God for all of you that are here with us on today. If you are not a regular attender of Boss, just wave your hand. you just hanging out with us today. Amen. There's a lot of y'all. Amen. <laughs> Hopefully y'all weren't forced here at gunpoint. <laughs> you, and you have a good time and you've had a good experience so far. Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Uh, I'm going to do this, you guys. I want to read it straight through. Um, and I'm going to read it from the Message Bible. But we're going to teach and preach from the ESV. Uh, but I want to read it to you so you can kind of get a feel for the story. For those of you that never heard this story before, 
and don't know who Ruth is. Uh, it's a very fascinating story. Movies have been made about uh, them. And so I want to read through it so you can kind of just hear it. Uh, and then we'll go back through and kind of walk through uh, what the Lord pulls out of it. All right. All right. So Ruth, I'm going to read Ruth beginning at verse one, chapter one. But I'm reading from the message, so it's going to be slightly different uh, than your Bible. So those that want to, you can just listen. And then when we get into the teaching, uh, we'll go back to the ESV or whatever version you want to use. All right, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 from the message says like this. Once upon a time, that's a way to start a story. Once upon a time, it was back in the days when judges led Israel. There was a famine in the land, a man from Bethlehem in Judah. He left home to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The man's name was Amimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. His son's name were Malon and Kilion, all Ephrites from Bethlehem in Judah. They all went to the country of Moab and settled there. Amimelech died, and Naomi is left with her and her two sons. The sons took Moabite wives. The name of the first was Oprah. <laughs> now nah, I'm just playing, not Oprah. Orpha, and the second was Ruth. Some of y'all not paying attention because y'all ain't. The second was Ruth. They lived there in Moab for the next 10 years. But then the two brothers, Malin and Kilion, died. Now the woman is left with either her, neither her husband nor her young men. One day she got herself together, she and her two daughters-in-law, to leave the country of Moab. And set out for home. She heard that God had been pleased and visited his people and gave them food. So she started out from the place that she had been living. She and her two daughters-in-laws with her on the road back to the land of Judah. After a short while on the road, Naomi told her two daughters, you know what? Go back. Go home and live with your mothers. And may God treat you as graciously as you treated your deceased husbands and me. May God give each of you a new home and a new husband. She kissed them and they cried openly. But they said to her, no, we're not going. We're not going back. We're going with you to your people. But Naomi was firm. No, go back, my daughters. Go back, my dear daughters. Why would you come with me? Do you suppose I still have sons in my womb who can become your future husbands? Go back, dear daughters. On your way, please. I'm too old to get a husband. Why? Why, even if I said there's still hope, and this very night I got a man and had sons, can you imagine being satisfied with waiting until they were grown? Would you want to wait that long to get married again? No, daughters, go, go back. This is a bitter pill for me to swallow, more bitter for me than you, for God has dealt me a hard blow. Again, they cried openly, Oprah, Oprah. <laughs> some reason my mind just keeps changing that word. Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth embraced her and held on. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law is going back home to live with her own people and gods. Go with her. But Ruth said, don't force me to leave you. Don't make me go home. Where you go, I go. Where you live, I'll live. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, I'll die. And that's where I'll be buried. So help me, God. Not even death itself is going to come between us. When Naomi saw that Ruth had her heart set on going with her, she gave in. And the two of them traveled together to Bethlehem. Uh, today, you guys, I want to continue in this part of our Multiply series talking about multiplying comfort. Uh, and, and last week we discussed, we looked at David. And the first part of multiplying comfort was having the ability to encourage or comfort yourself. Uh, many times during the holiday seasons, we uh, looked at the reality that often people are struggling during the holidays uh, because we have not properly grieved. And because we've not properly grieved, we have not been comforted, and we often don't know how to comfort one another. And the first step in to be able to comfort somebody else is knowing how to comfort yourself. So we looked at David and uh, in, in the text how David had lost so much, the enemy had come in and snatched the women, the children, burned the town down. And what did David respond? How did David respond 
to that level of loss, that level of loss of people and things. Um, but we kind of looked at, too, the reality that in David's situation uh, is more akin to uh, those of us that grieve living relatives in the sense that many living relatives, maybe from addiction or many other tragedies in life, are no longer who they used to be. And so even though they're alive, we often grieve because they're not who they've always been. They've become some other person. Uh, and so in David's case, David's case is unique because he lost some stuff, but there was still a possibility of what he lost coming back. Uh, and we looked at the fact that when you encourage yourself, you have to be self-aware, admit uh, what you're dealing with, how you actually feel. Uh, looked at that their prayer is a necessity in comforting yourself. David goes and asks God some tough questions. Should I go after him? What should I do? Uh, there's nothing wrong when it comes to comforting yourself in that time of prayer, asking God the tough questions. Uh, we talked about the place of worship and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The, te the Bible tells us when David lost his child with Bathsheba, uh, that he got up from fasting, washed his face, put on some clothes, and went to church, went to worship. Uh, and that there's power in corporate worship. So when you are grieving, when you're going through, uh, you want to be self-aware. You want to spend time in prayer. Uh, you want to spend time in worship. And know the word. Know the scripture. One of the, the, the key things about what the Bible says in Philippians when he says, uh, whatever things are good, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, think on these things. The Bible tells us uh, that whose mind is stayed on Jesus, stayed on God, he keeps that person in perfect peace. Uh, and so one of the keys to encouraging yourself as well as prayer, worship, and being self-aware is also focusing our minds on the things of God and things of beauty, things that God has created, enjoying life. And so we talked about that from that aspect on last week. Uh, now, there are several other ways, but we're going to kind of deal with more as we go through the message today. Uh, because last week was about encouraging yourself uh, how to comfort yourself, how to help yourself through tough times. Uh, today is about how do we walk with somebody else that is hurting. Uh, it, it's one thing, you guys, in the church, we, it's easy to, and I don't want to say easy, but a spirit of depression can be bound. Uh, spirits of condemnation, regret. We, we, can, we can pull out oil. We can uh, pray in tongues. We can lay hands and we can cast out demons. That's biblical. It's fine. And sometimes there's a place for it. However, I think sometimes we run very quickly to spiritual answers and we pass right over natural solutions. One of the things they teach you, they teach you, uh, uh, um, and when you do counseling, biblical counseling, uh, when you want to do it, be a chaplain, uh, pastoral care classes and seminary. Uh, one of the things they often say in those type of classes is this. Being is better than doing. Being is better than doing. B-E-I-N-G is better than D-O-I-N-G. What does that mean? Oftentimes when people are struggling. And somebody has gone through a loss, someone is grieving, someone is hurting. We start trying to do stuff for them. You start, you know, you make your little nasty spaghetti. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> and everybody knows nasty. That's, that's the thing. Everyone knows it's nasty, but because everybody already sad. We just, you know, roll with it. You know, just can't make it any worse. Daddy didn't die. We might as well eat this nasty spaghetti. Uh, but we're, well, really, we start doing stuff. And we, 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 because oftentimes we don't know what to do, we pick random stuff. Or we do what everyone else has been doing. That's why someone ends up with, and we laugh, but it's so true, they lose their mother, they lose their son, and they have a hundred dishes of casserole in the kitchen. Now, everyone that made the casserole meant well, but the reality is this. Oftentimes, you all, it is not often, it is always better to just be present with a person than trying to figure out what to do for a person. That's when we get in trouble, because when you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, you say stupid stuff. 
how you doing? Well, I just lost everything in my life, so, you know, I don't, you know, you tell me how I'm doing. You know, just, <laughs> we say stuff like, oh, I know how you feel. How do you know how I feel? How, how do you know? Unless you've gone through this exact same thing in the exact same context, you don't really know. And oftentimes, you all, there's nothing wrong with silence if you're present. There's nothing wrong sometimes just sitting next to a person rubbing their back. Just sitting in a room with somebody when you visit them in the hospital or you visit them in certain places, there's not deep science that you have to figure out with comforting other human beings. Many times it's more important and more transformative to just be present with somebody that is going through. Because the truth of the matter is many of us don't just experience one tragedy in life. See, it's easy to comfort yourself when it's one event. But what do you do when it's multiple events? How do you handle a barrage, a tsunami, if you will, of pain and suffering and tragedy? And when it keeps happening around the same time of year, some point we, we have concluded that in Scripture, Job is the only person that has deeply suffered. We call Job the king of suffering. Everybody talk about suffering, they go right to Job, uh, and then we go to Jesus. <laughs> but there are so many other examples in the scripture of people that suffer. Ruth and Naomi are a great example, mainly Naomi. And in the text, what we have here, you all, is this woman named Naomi. And Naomi lives in the time of the judges, all right? In the time of the judges, this is the context, this is the environment in which Naomi is living. She's living in the time of the judges where there is no open revelation. There, there, there are some prophets here and there. There's no king. So Israel does not have a political king or leader. And Israel's not having a great flow of prophetic vision and word. And so God uses judges during this period to bring some order. But the problem is it does not bring all the order that is necessary. There's no open vision. There's no flow of the word. And so Naomi lives in a condition or a context, watch this, that has moral decline, spiritual decay, decay, and national division. Does that sound familiar? Moral decline, spiritual decay, and national division. So she's living in this backdrop of a community, of a city, of a nation that is in turmoil, all right? Now, that's one thing. That's everybody. That's a big broad stroke. Everybody in this room knows how Naomi feels in that case because we live in a time where morality is declining, where spirituality is not as consistent or as powerful as it used to be with people not attending church like they used to, uh, people deciding that they can just love on God when they want to. It's changing. We live in a time where you are Republican or Democrat or independent that you can admit that our world is in political turmoil. So we all can identify with Naomi on that. But let's go a little bit further. Not only is Naomi in a place where morality is declining, people crazy, uh, the government's crazy, all kind of stuff is happening. On top of that, it's a famine. On top of that, there's no food. It's one thing when the world is crazy. It's another thing when the world is crazy and your stomach is empty. Y'all y'all acting real churchy. Don't pretend. Don't don't act like you don't get hangry. Ain't, is that what it's called? Baby, hangry. You get hangry. Uh, you and you just turn into this other creature when there's no food. Y'all see the Snickers commercials where it's just like uh, you need a Snickers. You're just being, you know. And so Imagine having to deal with all of that consistently, and now a famine arises. Now the conflict is this. There's a famine, the world is crazy, and I am a child of God. Naomi wouldn't make it long in today's culture because American culture and theology teach that when you are a child of God, you are exempt from hard times. 
We went through decades of name it and claim it, decades of prosperity theology that when the bubble bust and when the recession hit, you had legions of Christians questioning whether God was real because they had been taught for decades that God loving you equaled you having stuff. So when you are stripped of stuff, you now feel stripped of God. So what does Naomi do when you are an Israelite, the chosen of God, living in Bethlehem, Judah. Watch this. Judah representing praise. When you live in the place of praise and a famine hits. Many of us, not even just in the natural, but in the spiritual, we have hit hard times spiritually because your praise has dried up. What happens when a famine hits the place of your praise? Now, Naomi has to make a hard choice with her husband, Amimelech. Because now the question becomes, do we have faith? And many people that struggle through the holidays and many people that struggle through loss, you have these moments where you begin to wonder, do I have enough faith to stay where I am or do I feel forced to leave where I am? And what do you do with those choices? How do you make those hard decisions? We judge people harshly when they leave one church and go to another church. But sometimes we don't understand that they are grieving and they are hurting. And when you are in a place and it feels like you are experiencing a famine by yourself, what do you do? Don't be so quick to judge someone because they had to make a decision to leave the church y'all been at for 20, 30 years, 10 years, and you judging them, oh, you carnal, and oh, you just don't understand how God is moving. No, sometimes we don't understand that people are hurting and they don't know what to do when the world is crazy. They are hurting on their financially and in spirit, they can't worship anymore. Now, Naomi has to make a hard choice with her husband, and so they make the hard choice to leave. They leave the place called Bethlehem, and they go to this place you all call Moab. Moab wouldn't be such a big deal if it wasn't that it was Moab. (laughs) Let me explain it to you. Moabites... At one point in the history of uh, Jerusalem, not Jerusalem, but Israelites, the Moabites were prevented, prohibited from entering the sanctuary of God for 10 generations because the Moabites came as a result of the incestuous relationship Lot had with his older daughter. And they end up being in a long-term conflict with the Israelites. Y'all with me so far? So it's not that they just get up and move anywhere. They get up and move to the enemy. They get up and move with the heathens. It's real interesting, and I don't know if many of you have been in this place, but to meet and to know or to be a person that once had wealth and have to leave from wealth to go live in the hood. Oh, that'll shift you. And many of us, if we're honest, you've had times in life where God moved you from what you saw as great to what you saw as problematic. God, how do I live here? How how do I work here? You want me to be here? And then you question, maybe we didn't hear God. But then you look at the natural circumstance and you say, but we had no choice. Daddy died and didn't have insurance. So we can't keep the house. So you can't stay here. Mama died, no insurance. Uh, The the child died and we can't cover certain things. And so now we have to spend our savings to pay for the funeral. And now because you spent all your savings on the funeral and a famine arises in the land, now you don't have enough for the rent in the house that you love. And so now you got to leave the big house to go stay in a two-bedroom apartment all because you experienced loss. And then we look at people like they're crazy when they don't immediately respond with joy and happiness in the holiday and we condemn them as though they don't know Jesus. No, you don't know what they're going through. 
So they're in Moab. While in Moab, you think things would get better. The boys, the two young boys that grow up and you're watching the kids grow. Oh, look at the boy. You know, you just, we do stuff for our kids and we, we feel okay because it seems like if the kids are doing well, then it was okay choice. Boys grow up and the boys find two fine women, Ruth and Oprah. I'm just going to leave a name in Oprah, just, you know. It's just, we that kind of church. It's just Oprah for the rest of the day. They find two women. Now, now, there is some murmurings in the community. Because the Israelite boys they found them some Moabite women. It's really interesting in a church such as Boss where we, we push and we believe in diversity but I think there's a whole group of people in this world that say they're okay with diversity until you start dating their daughters. <laughs> can, we, can we be real for like two seconds? There's some black folk in here. You, you love white folks and you love Hispanic and all that stuff, but don't let your son bring home Becky. Boy, you know we only talk about that in church. <laughs> Can she cook greens? No, okay. No, Mom, she brought, she brought a pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie? <laughs> we don't do pumpkin pie in this house. You better get that girl some sweet potatoes. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. We got some of our white brothers that they love President Obama. But their son can't bring home a Keisha. <laughs> Let me tell you something real quick. I'm going to tell you something real, 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 real fast. But um, I used to use Shanika in those moments. And then one day I realized I was keeping her. And I said, I probably need to come up with a different name for, you know. You know. So anyway, anyway. Let's, we're, going, we, we're serious again. So people, people talking, people, people have issues. And so they marry these Moabite women. Life is good. Uh, Ruth seems uh, that she's a good young lady. And, and Oprah seems to be a good young lady. And Naomi is probably sitting back saying, okay, finally, Lord, we can rest a little bit. After all that we've been through, after coming here, maybe the move was good. Maybe this is what you desired. And so she's feeling a little bit of normality setting in. She's beginning to find her groove again. Again, and then her sons die. How does that affect the psyche of a person? To know I am the woman of God. And God, just when I thought things were looking up, We have people that come to church every week as zombies because they've been stunned and stung and hurt and prodded by life over and over. And we chastise them because they don't lift their hands. Sons die. Just her and the girls. Now, I need you to understand something. Greater context in this is this. In this day and age, patriarchy was much stronger than it is today. You think sexism is powerful today. In that time, everything about Naomi's identity and her finances were connected to either her husband or male sons. So it's not just she's lost relationship, she's lost financial support and future stability. What do you do 
when the person that dies took care of you. I want, I want y'all to think about when we, when we so casually uh, overlook people in their pain when a father has died or a mother has died or somebody that is a husband has passed or a wife that has passed. That's not just a relationship lost. That's income and resources lost. So now Naomi is back to square one. She done found a place where there's no famine. But now she got a personal one. And it's just her and her daughters. Not even her biological daughters. Her daughter-in-laws. Naomi gets the idea, hey, you know what, let's go back. We're going to ride out. Let's just, you know, some stuff comes up and they hear through the grapevine that uh, Bethlehem is not in the family anymore. God has sent food. And so Naomi's thinking, man, maybe, maybe let's go back. And many times for the person that is grieving and is not properly grieved, somewhere along the way you get in your head, if I can just go back to, things will get better. You start start thinking back to, when did everything shift? Oh, I remember when we left so-and-so. Those that have marriages that are on the rock, sometimes you say, if we could just go back to, when we first met. If we could just go back to our first laugh, our first kiss, our first dance, and, and we start running back down memory lane trying to recapture what we thought were the glory days. But the problem about running back down memory lane is you got to pass every street. So just like when you pop up at the good stuff, you're going to have to go through the bad houses. And you still have no solution for those seasons. So going back to the beginning does not help you. And Naomi has in her mind, if we could just go back here, because God, I heard, is doing something new. Let me go back and check it out. She gets up. She gets ready to leave. Her daughter-in-laws are with her. They own the road. Y'all read in the story, so he said, they were on the road a short time. Imagine the weight of that silence as they walk on that road. Many times you all, we, we assume that when someone has no words, they're not thinking. They're not feeling, they're not processing. But I want y'all to imagine for a second. Naomi, Orpha, and Ruth, as they walk this road. All three women have lost a husband. Of them, Naomi has lost the most. Orpha and Ruth are now leaving their home to go with their mother-in-law. Let me pause here for a second and say this parenthetically. Be careful about having antagonistic relationships with your in-laws. Hear me, y'all. We joke about it in our culture. We crack jokes all the time. And, uh, you know, it's cool. There are some differences that you just, you know, kind of just don't like, you know. Um, But how do we know God isn't using the in-laws in some type of way? And if you stay antagonistic or fighting them, how does that relationship ever produce maybe what God wants it to produce, whether in you or in them? So Naomi's walking back with her daughter-in-laws. Everybody's quiet for a little bit. And I imagine each of them are thinking a couple of things. Ruth and Orpha are thinking we're leaving everything. I hope she's right about Bethlehem. I hope she has good information that food is now there. Orpha's probably thinking a little bit further along the lines of, what am I going to do if she's wrong? Orpha's probably thinking, I don't really want to go. You ever done something because somebody else was doing it and you don't want to look like the bad person for not doing it too? I see y'all do that in worship sometimes. 
I, I've been like that before. I tell you, I'm like, I've been like that before. You go places with preachers, and we, you know, all the preachers sit in these special chairs or whatever. And sometimes I hate because if I'm just, you know, tired, or I'm not feeling the song, or I'm just not in. I just don't want to worship. I'm just, uh, I'm just in that place. Uh, and then all the preachers I'm sitting next to stand. Like, they all just stand, their hands all lifted, and I'm the only one sitting there. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> now nah, I got to stand up, too. Because y'all going to make me look so unspiritual. You know? Uh, <laughs> we've done that. Y'all done that, too. Don't act like you ain't never done that. And so, Orpha's going, going along with this, and she's just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is just too much. Oh, man, you know, I don't know why Ruth decided to go with her. I just don't think this is the best idea. And who's there? We don't know anybody there but Naomi. And Naomi left. She ain't been there in a long time. So, like, what are we? So, so she probably has all these thoughts going through her mind that she's not saying. Naomi now breaks the silence. Naomi turns to them and says, listen, y'all stay here. Go home with your mamas. This is your home. You don't have to go with me. I love y'all. It's okay. The Bible says they lift up their voices and weep. And as soon as they start weeping, Oprah says, deuces. <laughs> ah. She said, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Let me, let me say this to you guys. There are times when people that love you will leave you. It doesn't mean they don't love you. It means they don't have the capacity to go where you're about to go. Stop harboring all this ill will and anger to people that have left when their leaving was the best thing that could have ever happened to you and them. Hear me, listen. The worst decision to make is that when you're grieving to take luggage that's too heavy to carry, You'd have lost two family members, three family members. You've lost a job. You've lost a house. You've lost a relationship. You've lost a marriage. Why are you dragging a dead weight friendship? Because you don't want to be by yourself. And then when they fail us, which they will, because they never had the capacity to handle where you were going, and so it's ultimate that they are going to end up failing you. It adds to your grief. Why are you dragging folk along? You don't accept Christ. Why are you dragging people that don't want to go where you're going? How long are you going to harass somebody into coming to church with you? Outside of children and teenagers, they the only hostages that should be in church. <laughs> nah, they, they, they don't get no option. Train up a child. They, they don't get a choice. But grown people with free will, you drag that man into a relationship. He said, I'm not ready. You dragged him anyway. Well, I just, I was waiting for the Lord to tell me something. Your mama told you, your auntie told you, your girlfriend told you, uh, his friend told you, his cousin told you, his mama told you, he told you. <laughs> Pastor, I can't figure out where we went wrong. You started. <laughs> That's where you went wrong. You started. Don't let your grief. Take carry-on luggage you cannot take. It's a charge for that. 
And you're going to pay a cost for taking extra luggage you didn't need to bring with you. So Oprah says, I'm out. I got a TV show to do. <laughs> I, got a, I got a deal in the works back at back in Moab. Moab Channel 7, going to hook me up. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Naomi says, you all know, Naomi? Naomi says, okay, that's fine. No problem. Now, is Naomi being honest? Because at the end of the day, there's a part of her that's probably disappointed that Orpha walks back. But in her head, she says, and all y'all know, we know this, we've been there before, I expected that. That's what you wanted to do anyway. How much more now, if you're keeping tally, Naomi has the context of her society. She has a famine. She's lost her home, moved to a new home that is, is, is an enemy of where she's been. She's lost a husband. She's lost two sons. And now she's in a place where she feels by herself, even though there are two women with her. She gives them reason to leave. One takes it. Now she stands looking at Ruth, expecting the same response. And this is where I begin to challenge us when it comes to comforting people that are hurting. When God has assigned someone to you, it is not up to us to determine the criteria for which we remain with them. Some of us have walked away from people that God connected you to because you could only see where they were. Not where God was going to take them with you. Uh, y'all, y'all, y'all. Uh, uh, Ruth, Ruth, Ruth looks at Naomi in the face and she says to her, I want us to look at it together. Turn, turn, look at, look at your text. It is verse, dun, bum, 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 bum. Matter of fact, Naomi tells them, okay, this is 69, Naomi. They walk in, go back, may the Lord treat you kindly. Get you a new home and a new boo. Uh, God has dealt hardly with me. Verse 13. All right, verse 14. Verse 14. Let's do ESV. Verse 14 says this, then they... She, this is after Naomi has told them, you know, y'all going to do y'all thing. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. Watch this. But Ruth clung to her. Ruth cleaves to Naomi. This word you all clung or cleave here in the text. In the Hebrew, it translates to or means this, to figuratively catch by pursuit. Say that again. To catch by pursuit. Give you a better context. This is the same word in Hebrew that Adam uses in Genesis when he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Because any man here that's married, you know you got to catch up by pursuit. Got to chase after her like the cartoon, Wiley Coyote and, you know, Roadrunner. Just beep, beep. Um. <laughs> it's, it's the same word. Watch this. 
that word denotes and suggests, hear this, and those of you taking notes, you can, you can keep right. It suggests a covenant, all right, that has been formed by passionate pursuit, but not because of passion. Covenant that has been formed by passionate pursuit, but not because of passion, but because of purpose. See, Ruth has a revelation. I don't know when she had the revelation. I don't know when it clicked for her. She's been living with Naomi for a while now. She's met this woman. This woman's come in. They come into each other's lives. She's been around Naomi a minute. So it could have been somewhere along the years that she was married to her son, that she saw the elegance of Naomi. She saw the godliness of Naomi. She saw something in Naomi in their longstanding relationship that at some point it clicked in her head that I am to walk with this woman as long as God has this woman on this earth. This is not something that Naomi and Ruth it just pop up in that moment. Ruth didn't just have this hit her head in that moment. Ruth knew from some point in the past that if anything happened, I am assigned to cover this woman no matter what condition her life ends up in. And many of us, hear me, listen you all, we are Christians but we're fickle when it comes to how we courage and strengthen one another because we will stay with a person while everything is going well, oh, I'm praying with you, oh, I'm with you, but as soon as life begins to take a curve and a turn for them, we want to back up because we don't know what to say, we don't know what to do, and we're relying on our own strength to make them feel better. This is not about feeling, this is not about passion, this is not about your intellect or your knowledge, it's not about how many degrees you have in counseling or psychology, this is about you knowing the God in them, and God has assigned me to you and I'm going to stand with you no matter what you go through and I ain't got to say a word I ain't got to do anything else but wherever you go I go where you live I live what you do I do and I am with you to the end listen 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 she does not sit there and run down a list of all Naomi's issues she doesn't tell Naomi what she should do. See, many of us aren't comforters, we're controllers. You, 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 you pretend like you're comforting only so you can control. And God will reveal that. Be careful about that. So what ends up happening is Ruth sticks with this girl. I'm with you. I'm there. They get back to Bethlehem, and those of y'all don't know the story, it, it, it ends like a, a love story. It ends like a soap opera. Now, soap operas never really end. They just, just always something else. Uh, but it ends like one of those fairy tales, right? They get back, and this fine dude in town named Boaz. It's his sexy self. He, he, let's call him Denzel. Denzel's in town, and... Is Denzel say who is Denzel uh Omar who is somebody who's fine? Boris Kojo, Koji, Koji, um Matt Damon, Matt Damon, Matt Damon. Okay, whatever. Uh you you insert your fine person in your head. If your husband here, just say baby is you. Uh fine man in town. You know, Ruth, Ruth doing her thing. She she working, living life. With Naomi. Let me say this to you guys. Sometimes when God has assigned you to somebody, it might be seasonal. It might be long term. But there doesn't have to be anything special about what you do in that person's life. But be present. Ruth is working. She ain't sitting up under Naomi all day long. Some of us not present. We just annoying. Oh, let me keep on. Fine man and him and Ruth kind of, oh, okay, okay, 
So Ruth's hollering at Naomi, and Naomi's like, let me, let me put you on game, girl. Let me, let, me, let me teach you how to do this. She encourages Ruth to go out, and basically, uh, Scripture suggests that Ruth proposes to Boaz. Uh, yeah, I know. That's a woo. Uh, <laughs> and now the thing about this, though, you all, in context is this. Boaz, though, represents what the Bible calls a kinsman redeemer. So if Ruth, who's still connected to Naomi, marries Boaz, Boaz as a man in that time with no debt and has financial stability, not only does he restore them to stability, watch this, he can claim everything Amimelech had and lost. So he got what he got, and he can get what the husband had that died. This immediately restores Ruth and Naomi to where they were and surpasses where they were. So the crazy thing about this is that if you are listening to me now and you identify with Naomi and you feel like you are in the worst season of your life, let me encourage you by telling you this. God still listens to your voice. Y'all know, you see y'all nodding, but y'all don't believe me. I want y'all to look at bah, bah, dum, bum, bum, verse uh, go back to verse 11. No, go, go to verse 8. Naomi says to her two daughters, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you. Pause there. The word kindly uh, translates to, to mean a covenant love. A covenantal love. That's a love that is not rooted in conditions, but is rooted in covenant. All right? Y'all with me? So it ain't got nothing to do with how life is going. It has to do with uh, uh, this is my commitment. And may God deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the, me, with the dead and with me. The Lord, verse 9, grant that you may find rest in each of you in the house of her own husband. Look up this way. She prays. The message says, her request is that y'all will get new houses and new booze. That's what it say. I mean. <laughs> when you feel like you're Naomi. Know that you still have the greatest, valuable thing that you have never lost. And that's God's ear. How do you know that, preacher? Because if you look at what Naomi proclaimed, and then you look at where Ruth's life ends up, everything Naomi spoke over Ruth's life, because Ruth stuck with her in covenant, God honored the request of what came out of Naomi's mouth. And because, watch this, because Ruth clung to her and because Naomi spoke it, Ruth got it, but Naomi caught the overflow, y'all. Stop dreading so much all the things you've gone through because even for Naomi, the drought and the famine in verse 1 pushed her to her destiny. Those of you that are called to be Ruth, you have to understand that there are people you are assigned to that because of that assignment, God will open up purpose for your life. Ruth doesn't get Boaz if she doesn't stay with Naomi. But Ruth went with Naomi not knowing there was a Boaz. How many of us have missed out on Boaz? Because we could not stay with Naomi. How are you going to be a great spouse and you can't be a good friend? You're horrible to your girlfriends. You're horrible to your buddies. 
but you want God to bless you with the most awesome boo ever. You can't commit to people you don't have sex with. Y'all really going to pretend? <laughs> Let me say this to y'all, and, I'm, and, and we're done. Covenant compassion pursues the object of compassion, not out of passion, but out of purpose. If God has made you a comforter of other people, your comfort cannot be based on their conditions. It can't be based on how you feel. It can only be based on how God has assigned you to them. Because at the end of the day, y'all, Ruth and Naomi saved each other. How many things are you and I missing out on because you refuse to be a long-term comfort to somebody that's hurting? Because all you see is what you're going through. Ruth could have easily said, I'm in the same boat as you, girl. She was. She lost her husband. She, Naomi lost her husband. They, they both didn't have what they started out with. Y'all stop using what you don't have as an excuse. Because I tell you what you do have, you got you. And sometimes you is enough. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we bless you, God. We glorify you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you are speaking to your sons and your daughters. Thank you, God, we can hear from you in different ways that you can speak and share even through stories. Thank you for Ruth. Thank you for Naomi. Thank you for Ophrah. Thank you for their life. Thank you for how you use them to speak to us today. I pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, for somebody here that is a Ruth. That, Holy Spirit, you would give them the strength to stick it out. And, God, I pray for the Naomi's in the room that feel like they're hitting tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. I thank you, God, that you love them so much that you have intentionally found somebody and assigned somebody to walk with them through this season. Pray now in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you would remove all barriers to those relationships. God, that you would tear down walls and that you would let connections be made. Pray, Father, that we would not just be a church that gathers on Sunday, but there will be a group of people that do life together. And that you would unite those that should be united, connect those that need to be connected, that we may walk each other into our destiny.